Greetings students and welcome to another video on complex variables. In this lesson I'm going to talk about conformal mapping, which is a really important concept in complex variables. Let's say that I have a complex plane, and in that complex plane I have two finite curves, gamma A and gamma B. Each curve is parameterized such that gamma A gives me a complex number ZA for some real number T defined between T1 and T2, while gamma B gives me a complex number ZB for some real number T also defined between T1 and T2. These curves gamma A and gamma B are also directed, which means that as I increase T from T1 to T2, I move along gamma A in this direction and gamma B in this direction. The point of intersection of gamma A and gamma B, I'm going to label that as Z0. Now suppose I have a complex function f of Z that maps a complex number Z in the complex Z plane to another complex number W in the W plane, which I'm going to draw right over here. In the W plane, these curves gamma A and gamma B, which are basically tracings of different values of Z, would then be transformed to tracings of different values of W. So gamma A might become capital gamma A and gamma B might become capital gamma B in the W plane. Another way to define capital gamma A is to write it as WA of t, where WA of t is really just the function f applied to ZA of t. The same logic can be applied to capital gamma B, except now we have WB of t. Just like gamma A and gamma B, the image curves, capital gamma A and capital gamma B, are also directed. The intersection of these curves I'm going to call W0, which is really just f of Z0. Now the function f of z is said to be a conformal mapping or conformal transformation if the angles between curves in the z-plane are equal to the angles between curves in the w-plane. In other words, a conformal mapping is a mapping in which there is preservation of angles locally, meaning in the neighborhood of the individual point z0. Basically, a conformal mapping is one in which the angle in the z-plane conforms to the angle in the w-plane. In this video, I'm going to come up with some conditions for f of z to be a conformal mapping, and to come up with those conditions, I'll need to calculate these two angles. How do I do that? Well, I can draw a tangent line here for gamma a, and another one here for gamma b. Then I can subtract the angle that this tangent line makes from the angle that this tangent line makes. When I do that subtraction, I can calculate this pink angle between the curves gamma a and gamma b. And then I can do the same in the w plane. Find the tangent line to capital gamma a at w0, find the tangent line to capital gamma b, and subtract the angles made by those tangent lines to get the corresponding pink angle in the w plane. Now if the pink angle in the z plane equals the pink angle in the w plane, then all the other angles in the z-plane will also equal their counterparts in the w-plane. In other words, I just need to show that the pink angles are equal between the z and w-planes for f of z to be a conformal mapping and have full preservation of angles. Why is that? And why do I need to show that just one angle is equal? Well, it's just simple geometry. The pink angles are automatically equal to their opposite angles, the angles that are facing down. Because of this, the angle on the right is also equal to the angle on the left, because the pink angle plus the angle on the right is 180 degrees, and the pink angle plus the angle on the left is also 180 degrees. So if the angles facing up, the pink angles are equal, the angles facing down are also going to be equal, and the same equality will apply to the angles facing right and left. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I need to use the tangent lines to find these pink angles. But how do I calculate the tangent lines? Well, I can take the derivative of ZA and ZB with respect to T to find the tangent lines in the Z-plane, and then take the derivative of WA and WB with respect to T to find the tangent lines in the W-plane. Remember, tangent lines are found by simple differentiation of curves with respect to their parameters. So once we calculate these angles using equations that relate these tangent lines to each other, we'll be able to come up with conditions for f of z to be a conformal mapping. So at this point, I've set up my pre-image scenario with the curves on the z-plane and my image scenario with the curves on the w-plane after we do the transformation or the map f of z. Let's find some angles. 
Specifically, we're going to focus on this angle between gamma A and gamma B at the intersection Z0. Then we're going to see how this angle changes as we undergo the transformation f of z. Let's begin by writing the derivative of w a with respect to t using this w a equation right here. I'll call this equation 1. And just note that when I made this equation 1, I just used the simple chain rule. We'll also use the w b equation to write the derivative of w b with respect to t. And again, we're going to apply the chain rule to get the following. I'm going to call this equation 2. Now from equation 1, if the derivative of w a with respect to t equals the derivative of f with respect to z a times the derivative of z a with respect to t, then the arguments of these left hand and right hand sides are also equal. Essentially, we can take the argument of both sides of equation 1 to get this argument equation. And right next to this argument equation, I'll write the corresponding argument equation for equation 2 using w, b, and z, b this time. Now, the argument of the product of two complex numbers is the sum of the arguments. So we can break down the argument of products in these two equations to the sum of the arguments of the individual factors. Now, if you don't believe me on this product of arguments equals the sum, then let me go on the side to explain further. Say I have two complex numbers, a and b. A has an argument of theta a, so it looks like this when I write it in exponential form, while b has an argument of theta b, so it looks like this when I write it in exponential form. If I multiply a and b, here's what I'll get. And since the product of the exponentials is just the sum of the exponents, I can simplify this product of complex numbers to the following. So the argument of this product now is just the sum of theta a and theta b, which is the sum of the original arguments. And that's why if we go back here, I broke up the argument of the product on the right-hand side to the sum of the individual arguments. Anyway, let's explain these argument equations with some before and after pictures of the individual curves gamma a and gamma b. We'll draw two sets of axes in the z-plane and w-plane, and let's draw the curves gamma a and its image after applying the function f of z, which is capital gamma a. If I pick z0 as my example point again, then this argument equation says that the argument of dz by dt at z0 plus the argument of df by dza at z0 equals the argument of the dwa by dt at the image of z0, which is w0. Now, what do the arguments of dz by dt and dw by dt even mean? Well, as mentioned earlier, dz by dt and dw by dt both represent tangent lines to the curves given by z and w. The arguments of these tangent lines therefore then represent the angle that those lines make relative to the positive horizontal axis. So dza by dt at z0 represents this tangent line, so its argument represents this angle. Same idea with the argument of dwa by dt at w0. As a result, this argument equation says that the angle of the tangent line at z0, which I'll call a0 now, becomes the angle of the tangent line at the image point w0 by the addition of the argument of df by dz. And I'll call this image angle a0 prime. If I put my argument equation now in terms of a0 and a0 prime, here's what I will get. And I'll call this equation 3. I can give the exact same explanation for the other argument equation, the one involving gamma b and its image. So here's what I'll do again. I'll draw two sets of axes in the z-plane and w-plane with the curves gamma b and its image, capital gamma b. Again, my point of reference will be z0 and its corresponding image w0. Just like with gamma a and its corresponding image, this argument equation says that the angle of the tangent line to gamma b at z0 which I'll call b0, plus the argument of df by dz at z0, equals the angle of the tangent line to capital gamma b at w0, which I'll call b0 prime. If I now put my argument equation in terms of b0 and b0 prime, here's what I'll get. I'll call this equation 4. Now, the angle I want to compare between the two curves is b0 minus a0 in the z-plane and b0 prime minus a0 prime in the w-plane. That is the angle that I want to preserve with the conformal transformation. If I plug in b0 prime and a0 prime using equations 3 and 4, here's what I will get. I can move the terms around to get the following for b0 prime minus a0 prime, the angle between the curves in the w-plane. 
Now I'm going to call this equation 5. Let's stand back and analyze equation 5 for a bit because it's quite important. We can see that if the difference of arguments between df by dz a and df by dz b is 0, then the angle between curves in the z plane at z naught and the angle between curves in the w plane at w naught are equal to each other. In other words, if this difference in arguments between df by dz a and df by dz b is 0, then there is preservation of angles. And we know from earlier on in the video that if there is preservation of angles when we go to the image of a transformation f of z, then that transformation is a conformal mapping. Therefore, if this argument difference is 0, f of z is a conformal mapping. But at z0, df by dzb and df by dza should be the same. After all, f is a function of z. It doesn't really discriminate between za and zb. So its derivative with respect to z is the same, regardless of the curve that z follows if you're at z0. There is no reason for df by dz to be different. It must therefore be the same regardless of whether we have za or zb. So that means the difference between arguments is always zero, right? Well, not quite. If df by dz were zero, then its argument would be undefined. Zero isn't really at any angle relative to the positive real axis. Zero is just straight up in the center of everything. Therefore, in order to guarantee that this difference between arguments is zero, df by dz must be a non-zero number at z naught, the point where we are calculating our angles. And this finally brings us to our condition for conformal mapping. The only way we can have our pre-image angles at z naught be equal to our post-image angles, the one way we can have preservation of angles at z0 is to ensure that number one, f of z is analytic at z0. This should be obvious. It must be analytic in order for us to be able to differentiate f of z. It must be differentiable. We use derivatives the whole way through. It can't be not differentiable. The second condition is that the derivative of our transformation, the derivative of f of z is non-zero at z0. And if these two conditions are satisfied, then there will be preservation of angles between two random curves as we go from the z-plane to the w-plane, as we've just demonstrated. And in general, if we want f of z to be a conformal mapping over an entire domain d in the complex z-plane, it must be analytic over that entire domain d, and its derivative must be non-zero everywhere in that domain d. Now, the conditions for angle preservation that I've just demonstrated, that df by dz must be non-zero for angles to be preserved, these conditions make up what's called the conformal mapping theorem. If there is preservation of angles after a transformation f of z, then that transformation f of z must have a non-zero derivative at the point of interest. It is this theorem that we proved in this video. Now, let's take a final detour and talk about our sponsor today, RAID Shadow, I mean uh, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community that offers thousands of inspiring classes for creative and curious people on topics including illustration, design, photography, web design, freelancing, and more. We're already mostly just sitting at home and watching online classes, so why not learn something tangible and develop your creative side? There's so many lessons on painting, productivity, web development, and a whole slew of other topics that you can't really go wrong with Skillshare. This series on productivity, for example, by fellow future attending physician Ali Abdal, is quite good when you're stuck in a productivity rut. And best of all, Skillshare is quite reasonably priced for us debt-ridden college students. It's less than $10 a month for an annual subscription. And if that sounds good, there's an additional kicker. Because Skillshare is sponsoring the video, the first 1,000 people to use the link in my description will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership. So click the link in that description and make this pandemic here a productive one. Huh. See what I did there? Anyway, that should do it for this lesson. I'd like to thank the following patrons for supporting me at the $5 level or higher. And if you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan signing out.